ordinary people are too stupid to participate in elections. And to save democracy, we need to have only educated people vote. That is, I think that that is like, you're seeing inklings of this already from the liberals, you know, that you actually have to like remove the franchise from people to preserve democracy. Whatever the f that means. As, as much as we throw around the word fascism to mean anything, the liberals are throwing around democracy to mean goddamn anything nowadays. In the eight years since Trump's last victory, once fringe subcultures like the alt-right have metastasized, they now influence politics on the street and indeed in the Oval Office. In 2024, both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris adopted online meme cultures as their native tongue, a practice unthinkable even a decade ago. Once fringe and esoteric ideas have gone mainstream. Someone who's spent his career as an artist and political theorist documenting this is Joshua Citarella. His podcast, Doom Scroll, dissects this phenomenon with a forensic and sympathetic eye. We spoke to him a few days after the election about the privatization of everyday life, whether or not the Democrats can recover from this bloodbath of a defeat, and of course, how to actually gain power in this strange new mirror world. Josh Cedarella, yeah. welcome to Navarra. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. In the early 2000s, um, music changed quite a lot as producers started adopting to the new environments people were listening to music. So people would listen to music on mobile phones and so on. So they sort of modulated the music mm. uh, in order to make sense when it was coming out of a, a handheld mobile phone played on the back of a bus by you know, a school, ch school, school child. When you're looks maxing, what is the context that you are imagining yourself being seen in? Is it, is it online? Is it in person? Is it the gym mirror selfie? Like, what is the thing you're tuning yourself to right. as a looks maxer? Right. Well, I guess you see people optimize for the um, front facing camera, uh, you know, a certain type of like, almost like contouring for, for women where, you know, it's very glamorous from head on. And then if you see someone turn to the side, it's like, oh, all of a sudden you see all this brushwork and just kind of weird shadows that don't make sense when they're viewed from literally any other perspective mm. that's not uh, straightforward. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, a large portion of those things are just kind of uh, tuned to, for social media, for taking selfies. Um, that said, there is also a, a large gamut of people who are interested in this stuff. And some of it is not necessarily just their own kind of narcissistic self-presentation, but a kind of weird interest in like phenotypes and phrenology and like measuring skulls and, and that type of shit. So there are definitely um, a lot of side profiles as well. What is the phenotype that you're trying to adopt? I'm, well, I don't think that you can uh, alter your, your phenotype. There's a, there's a few different misconceptions around this. So uh, the idea of mewing, what is generally referred to as mewing, um, encompasses quite a few things, which the, uh, the idea that through resistance training, you can build up your jaw muscles, the masses or muscles, and mm, this one's make good. a yeah, kind of more square, Chad-like jaw. Like That is just empirically true. You go to the gym, you'll, your muscles will increase if you uh, use resistance training. But subsequent to that, there is a kind of more uh, niche uh, fringe interpretation, which is that through applying pressure to the roof of your mouth, you are actually shifting the shape of your skull. Um, I, that is not correct. So that, that part is fake. And both they're both referred to as like generally the same process. I've seen that referred to both in sort of alt-right influencers, if we can still right. use that term, yeah, yeah. For, which I think is dubious. Right? We got to right have a like, better term for it, but I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. But I've also seen it referred to by people like Andrew Huberman, who mm, have become yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, the sort of central person in right. a network of science-backed optimization of right. life. Mm. Are people trying to optimize themselves more now, do you think? Are they doing it more? Like, is, it, it certainly has, feels like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's hard, it, it's hard to say, because how are you going to measure that? You know, people have always considered their self-presentation, right? That's, I mean, w when are you going to find a period in history where people don't care about how they look? Um, but are they doing it more? I think they're doing it now in weird ways that are uh, heavily incentivized by the attention economy. We could say that that is qualitatively different. And the sort of health aspect of that as well. So, you know, um, take these five supplements to sleep sort of maximally well, and then mm. wake up again and be back in the sort of the hustle economy. Right. That's a kind of a, right. a, a the kind of attention to not just doing well at work or trying really hard, but mm. also optimizing yourself so that you can 
become a person who tries really hard at work or so that you can right. become sort of right. maximized as an individual. Mm -hmm. There's something mm -hmm. almost utopian in that, isn't there? Mm. Well, uh, there, I mean, there's different approaches to it because there's people who are, you know, they're taking like Adderall or something like that so they can be more productive during work. And it's like, you know, that's a little bit more extreme than just like having three cups of coffee in the morning or something like that. Uh, and then there's another, there's people who are, opt who are trying to optimize to increase their productivity so they're a better worker, so that they have a better wage or, you know, better quality of life or whatever. And then there's people who are optimizing because they have these kind of metaphysical beliefs of what masculinity is or really kind of abstract stuff. So uh, there's different branches of these cultures and the, the kind of like hustle culture of like, being, you know, waking up at 6 a.m. and like going to the gym and then clocking into work and working super late hours and like that kind of like hustle grind set stuff is like a little bit, it's a little bit different than um, the idea that we should return to like a pre-industrial society in which like men were men and like, you know, hunter gatherers or, you know, Mongolian steppe warriors or some bullshit. So there's, uh, it's hard to kind of lump those things <laughs> together into the same category. But this is, I mean, part of the terminology that we're using it's like we don't have enough language and granularity to describe these different groups and we call them like alt-right influencers and i know exactly what you mean yeah. by that but like the proper alt-right is just not um that that hasn't been around for a long time yeah. and so part of the difficulty is like there are groups that have uh infra right wing conflicts between them they disagree on important stuff and for us to have the specificity to name all of these different cultures is just there's not the time in pop culture for everyone to be familiar with these like very niche uh, factions and their different interpretations. But those things, they do then become important because, sorry, this is the, this is the arc that I want to get to is that some of the people who are making those kind of maxing arguments from like the metaphysical perspective are making criticisms of capitalism that would differentiate, they would differentiate themselves from the people who are like, hustle, grind set, like, you know, male influencer type shit. Um, they are trying to participate in capitalism effectively. The other people are trying to overthrow it towards, I don't know what that might be. It might be some, you know, the third position, national socialist, whatever, or it just might be anarcho-primitivism and then reverting back to neo-band societies and abandoning modernity and feudalism. There's all sorts of interpretations, but um, critiques of capitalism from the right are especially important now because critiques of capitalism from the left are just clearly quantitatively not traveling as far on social media. And so differentiating those things, um, a person who is maybe amenable or open to those narratives, critiques of capitalism from the right, is someone that I think we can potentially recruit towards left-wing left ideas because we are more coherent than they are. Um, but if someone is trying to do like the hustle grind set thing and just be an entrepreneur, they are not gonna be receptive to our message. So that's that's the kind of important divide there. There's something about the sort of the wish for a full life, mm -hmm. for a um, a fully maximized experience on this earth that lots of this right wing culture I think speaks to, mm -hmm. um, and particularly I think it speaks to a rejection of uh, censoriousness. Mm -hmm. And censoriousness is a very big part of the increasing liberal politics that we've right. seen in this election. Right. I think, and I want to yeah. kind of come back to that. But first of all, let's talk about the thing that you are. I mean, this is the thing you are specialized in. But let's talk sort of from a, a more you know, fundamental basis. You're an expert in youth politics, really, like the kind of the ways in which people adopt online personas. And that mm -hmm. means, youth politics means online politics to a very large extent. Not exclusively, yeah. but to yeah. a very large extent. Right. You've interviewed a lot of people who have extremely diverse beliefs, right? And you already pointed to the self-differentiation inside that. That's really important, right? Right. Because when we think about the right, people often assume there's a sort of a homogeneity. The right is even more fractious than the left is, right? If, if you're on the left, <laughs> right, you know, yeah, yeah. You, you know <laughs> yeah. like people who just like disagree with each other, like tiny things, yeah, it's yeah. much worse on the right, like right. even more so. Yeah. So you talk to them about their beliefs, but I want to get sort of anthropologically interested mm -hmm. as a, a British person in America, mm. what is daily life like? Mm for the kind of people who you're talking to, these relatively young people who have extremely precise, yeah. but often quite incoherent beliefs. Mm -hmm. What are they actually doing all day? Like just describe like a, a daily life in this kind of uh, yeah. Yeah. This environment. Well, so there's a, there's a spectrum of the people that I've interviewed. So I'll share kind of a, a few different stories of uh, 
The people that I would talk to, many of them I have now known for uh, quite a few years. So I first wrote, um, it's a, technically a book in that it's printed as a book, but it's a, you know, a long essay, it's about 10,000 words. Um, and then 10,000 of uh, essays by people in these subcultures, memes and, and whatever. So it's a kind of ethnographic look into a mimetic subculture. I published that in late 2018. And um, subsequently I did a bunch of audio and written interviews uh, in the years following. Some of these people I've been in touch with now for, uh, I don't know, since uh, 2017, what is that, seven, seven years yeah. almost? And so I've watched them move through different belief systems. Um, they've gone to the left, to the right, so all over the place. Uh, and I've had conversations with them through that process and kind of un tried to understand their thinking as they, they make these different leaps. So some people uh, who got politicized online uh, a very interesting case was there was a young woman who was a libertarian. She then got interested in the work of like neo-reactionary thinkers like Curtis Yarvin, for example, called herself a neo-monarchist, NRX. She then went to college. So and neo, so neo-monarchist as in like believes in the rights of kings, believes in the necessity of a king, often a sort of benevolent CEO, dictator, mm -hmm. or something like this. Right. NRX, neo-reactionary yeah. thought comes from Curtis Yarvin. Just a right. call this for our listeners. No, no, exactly, exactly. So, uh, important in that it is not the kind of like absolute monarch or divine monarch or like the kind of the kings of like feudal empires that were uh, divined by God or something like that. It's like a yeah, it's a CEO who is a, a dictator of whatever kind of patchwork microstate you're in, um, and they refer to it as the monarch. It comes from this book, uh, Democracy: The God That Failed by Hans Hermann Hoppe, who's one of these libertarian thinkers who then kind of you know shifts over into this uh, a very kind of uh, a different type of thinking that has a lot to do, a lot less to do with individual rights and so on. Sorry, so the, the point of this is that going through all of those belief systems when you're uh, still at the age where you've not yet gone to college, she went to college, she met a bunch of people, made friends, had people to hang out with in real life, and within a few years she was no longer interested in politics whatsoever. So went from being like a libertarian to a monarchist to just basically being depoliticized and being a normal person with interests in like music and cooking and stuff like that. Okay, um, okay so that, that that's one possible outcome. There are other people who got politicized online and then did things like join the National Guard. They There are people who got politicized online and you know the group that I was focusing on when I, I was first writing the book, the ages were 12 to 17. As the years have gone forward, it's, it's basically the same group of kids that were politicized in the kind of wake of 2016, that you were like 14 years old in 2016, you're heavily politicized online, you have no understanding of history or whatever, and then how does your life turn out when you spend years in these like hyper politics, mimetic subcultures? What does that What does that do? Some of those people who were raised in that environment chose to have children at age 18. Those kids are now growing up. They're people who exist in the world. Those are decisions that have you know, consequences moving forward. You have to provide for this person, you have to feed them, you have to clothe them, and so on. Um, and so to say that like the mimetic subcultures they were interested in did not have lasting effects would be entirely untrue in those cases. You know, enlisting in the National Guard, for example. Um, on the left, uh, there's a few people who made contact with a, I would say, largely insignificant uh, communist organization that is located in the UK and France, I probably not name them because they're they're so small to like blow up their spot. Um, I went back and looked at um, six months of their correspondences between these uh, two particular groups that were kind of um, for some reason captured the political imagination of these young people. Six month correspondence about why they disagreed about issuing a joint statement against the war in Ukraine. So this is basically a kind of like intellectual hobby for people who are. 60, 70 years old and just like to kind of have theory debates with each other rather than do anything. Um, that was really appealing to a group of like 15 or 16 year olds such that some of them joined the organization, went to Europe to meet these people, do conferences, do lectures, do debates and, and so on, you know, training the next, gev uh, next generation of revolutionaries. Uh, the people who have been involved in that, some of them are still sympathetic to it. Others have entirely just opted out and have like very different belief systems now. So um, a young man who is kind of the like chief pedagogue, one of the like most influential people in this space, running uh, reading groups in discords and uh, writing prolific essays at age uh, uh, 15. He's gone through uh, quite an evolution. 
age 13, he's politicized through the kind of fallout of Gamergate. He's into Milo Yiannopoulos, Ben Shapiro, this type of stuff, mm -hmm. very, very right wing. Age 16, he gets into communism. He gets into, uh, you know, international proletarian revolution. And then now it's, you know, many years later after he's like been in the organization, met these people in real life, attempted to organize. And he's basically uh, a kind of crypto libertarian nihilist now like uh, ra rational gambling, I would say, is his ideology. Like he heavily invested swing trading um, believes that within his lifetime, Bitcoin will be the reserve currency of global finance. Um, and that, uh, and he may be correct about this, that like the kind of crypto infrastructure is a 21st century mechanism of governance that we will see happen uh, in you know the next whatever, 40 years or something, these kind of like burgeoning network state type of uh, structures totally different, but all of that is within the scope of like what a young person going through these belief systems in seven, eight years, you know, um, it's, yeah, that, that, so that, that has been the work that has been the work to like talk with these people to understand how they move through these different belief systems with the end goal of hopefully leveraging some of those ideas and insights into how you can make that process work towards slightly better outcomes at some point. <laughs> <laughs> That's really fascinating. I think those are some really amazing characters. And I think it's really important to have this level of, of granular detail when we're thinking about youth politics now, because like there is a, there are so many trajectories, right? And there are so many ideas up for grabs. There are so many ideas swirling around on the internet. Yeah. And I do want to talk a bit, a bit later about that information environment, what it's like not just to be susceptible to misinformation, Right, but to just to have right. Wikipedia, right, to have the entire archive of political thought right. open to you yeah, and yeah. able to be like assembled from a sort mm -hmm. of grab bag. But I want to zoom out first of all to talking about youth voting patterns in general. Mm -hmm. This election, we've seen two things happen that I think are quite distinct, and they are mostly between like boys or young young men, mm -hmm. young women. Mm -hmm. Young men have gone really far to the, the right, right. Uh, in terms of their voting. Uh, yeah. Many, many, many of them, more of them voted for Trump, even than voted the last time around. And they were, it was already a majority for Trump. This time it's a really, really overwhelming majority. Young women have not done what the Democrats wanted them to do uh, and vote on things like abortion access and so on, and have also shifted to the right in mm -hmm. this, this election. How do you understand that? How do you understand the sort of the gender dynamics of those, those right. kind of moves? Right. Yeah, I mean, we're so we're so close to it right now. It's, um, I mean, I, I would basically say that what any group you fill in the blanks, what the Democrats expect them to do, they generally do the opposite. Like whoever <laughs> whoever is in charge of this shit is just so thoroughly disconnected from reality that mm -hmm. they like on every group they are unable to predict remotely their behavior in the real world. Like these people are illegitimate. They should be fired. They should be maybe just exiled or sent to an iceberg or something like that. Like they're, they are fucking shit up. Um, that half of that is a joke. I, it'll be a nice iceberg uh, right. for them. Right. So I'm not, to I'm not totally sure how to, my instinct is that young people are, they're aware that they're downwardly mobile. They're not going to have a route into the middle class. So they're looking at they're looking at the potential of their life as, you know, they're going to work in some kind of, uh, I don't know, Amazon fulfillment center or some shit like that. So the kind of, you know, um, Brahmin moralizer, Democrat politics that is just, you know, this kind of fanatical rhetoric that characterizes so much of their PR campaigns, their, their publicity, their outreach efforts. Um, that is just off-putting to people who, if you don't participate in an, elite, in an elite institution and that rhetoric does not behoove your upwards advancement in a you know fancy university college or some shit, like you don't care about it. You don't care about it at all. And so just the, you know, this, we were talking about Thomas uh, Piketty before, but the Brahmin left and the merchant right, like if you are downwardly mobile uh, and you're working class, like, I don't know, common sense, small business politics that, that you know, the, the merchant right will offer, kind of more appealing for people. Um, I, I, there's probably some element of this where there is a kind of cultural influence of, uh, you know, alt media and stuff like that. But I don't know, that, that just doesn't seem like enough to me. That doesn't seem like enough that uh, there's a lot, of, I see a lot of think pieces that people are trying to pin all of this and like, oh, well, it's like Aiden Ross and it's uh, all of these different kind of, you know, uh, male Twitch streamers that are like conservative leaning. Like, I don't think 
Those are big channels, but they don't have big conversion rates. These are not people that like go to it for political content and voting advice that like they can they can mobilize people like a uh, say a relatively niche figure that has like extremely high conversion rates can turn people out to canvas and stuff like that. These are these are celebrities. It's like Kim Kardashian posting something and there's a fraction of 1% of anyone who clicks through or follows the the advice. So I kind of I don't know. I I, I think that the 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 two options available, um, if you're a person who's looking at just a grinding life of hard work, long hours, and still being in poverty, you just don't care a lot about a lot of these elite values. And uh, yeah, you're, you're happy to kind of throw, throw your lot in with like, we'll, we'll just uh, you know, make sure that business is doing well type of politics. Would you say that the, the avatar of that merchant right in the contemporary Republican Party is J.D. Vance, or is, who is the person who we sort of hook that onto as a yeah, figure? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's not in Vance or Trump uh, as as individuals. I would say I think they're they're a little bit they're a little bit different. Um, talking about the uh, economy is maybe the mo- the strongest indication. I'm not sure if there's like a great avatar of the merchant right right now. There, but there are many avatars of the Brahmin left. For it's example. not Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah, he could be. He's a little bit more um, ideological, though. You know, this like this kind of idea of having these, you know, a wall of tariffs and then kind of competing feudal microstates or whatever kind of dystopia we're going to devolve into. Like, that's a little bit too thought through. And you know, in my mind, the merchant right is someone who's just like, well, we should lower taxes because small businesses are struggling. Like, common sense conservatism. On the election night, we drove from Pittsburgh, which is where we were meeting mm-hmm. people, including members of the DSA, uh, the Democratic mm-hmm. Socialists of America, who were very nice and, and, and clever and so on. And we drove out from Pittsburgh to a casino, um, mm-hmm. some 1 to 2 a.m., right, to desperately try and find an election party. You guys do not have election parties. You don't know what it means to <laughs> I, stay up till 7 a.m. I, I went to one. Well, I made okay, it until, well, we until like 4.30, I think. But that's we, nothing. We knew at that point. Yeah. No, sure, but you've got, you've got, it, it's, it's, it's an 8 a.m. <laughs> return home. That's, the, that's what defines wow, elections in the wow. UK. Okay. And we drove from Pittsburgh out to that casino through uh, a gigantic, what do you call it, strip mall? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. It was one long road, mm-hmm. 45 miles an hour, and then on either side there were these parking lots and there were these gigantic box shops. And we mm-hmm. drove for 50 minutes yeah. and it was uninterrupted, mm-hmm. like completely uninterrupted. And this is just not a kind of environment that, that exists in the UK as far well, as I'm aware. I don't think right, that I can right. name a place where that would be mm-hmm. the case. Can you describe the environments of these sort of swing states that have now gone decisively to Trump, because I think it's an unfamiliar thing from the, from the UK audience. Yeah, yeah. Where are people, like, and what right. is it like to be in those places? Because you have a very, you, you know, um, in the late 19th century, America was sort of famous for its like robust civic society. Mm-hmm. That seems to have completely mm-hmm. evaporated, mm-hmm. and it's been replaced with this kind of enormously elongated shopping districts. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you understand these environments? Well, I mean, uh, I, I first want to say that your uh, your coverage. Uh, it, this um, the election um, piece uh, from a few days ago. Also, it was just some of the best stuff that I've seen from any media. Not Thank you to this guy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> incredible, incredible work. Uh, the you know, in, and especially not being like from the states, but just re- really important uh, coverage. So, mm-hmm. very grateful to see that. Um, I would say that. So, I didn't grow up in a swing states. Um, I've spent time in these places, but um, I, I don't have the experience of uh, living there and or you know. Uh, being in a place where there's a real kind of 50-50 split on on some of these issues. I would say that of the young people that I've interviewed, and it's an admittedly small sample size, um, intensive internet use is uh, seems to correlate with people who live in more rural areas who need to connect with communities through the internet because they are geographically separated, like they can't walk to a friend's house after school. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would say that generally the kind of like breakdown of uh, social life has um, <laughs> led to a lot of that stuff. I'm thinking of, I talked to um, Amber Lee Frost a few weeks ago on the, on, on the podcast, and we went through these kind of examples of like, you know, comedy clubs and art galleries and music venues and stuff like that. Like there's something that happened with creative life that just got ground out, like even just young social life, like a ground out by the increasing cost of rent, right? That, that is basically the case for every, um, uh, you know, metropolitan hub, what have you. But then there's also things like, um, 
one of the examples that gripped me the most was that there were different types of like identities and like things that would happen in, in neighborhoods that people could do together. Like fixing a car, like being a car guy used to be like a type of, that was a type of dude. You know, there were guys just like, yeah, Frank is really good at cars. If you have a problem, you go to Frank. And the way that those things operate now is that uh, you have to bring your car to like the dealership because everything is closed off by this IP and the repairman actually works at the dealership. And so this kind of like, uh, the social infrastructure of people being able to help each other out, like that has actually been privatized. Uh, it says you can't repair your own car. You have to drive it to the engine rather than ask your neighbor. You know, and I mean, that was the environment that I grew up in. We literally asked our, our neighbor to help fix stuff with the car. He's like really good at it. You know, his name was not Frank, it was Fred, but he was, he was really good at uh, fixing cars. Um, but that kind of example has kind of, that has basically happened to everything, you know? So think of like, a, a local sports league, for example, right? If you were gonna play softball in your town, you're now on some type of app. You're on like a, you know, some platform that is mining you for data and is introducing like weird market incentives into how you even form your softball team. So that like process of social atomization and introducing markets into every aspect of social life is like, yeah, of course people are like hyper individuated and like miserable and feeling lonely. That's a uh, makes entirely makes sense. And this space of daily life, the space of sort of community cohesion gets replaced with what I think has been very accurately described as a vapor space, mm. sort of a gigantic mm. collection of, um, which is the internet, right? right? A gigantic collection of designations and tags and identities and little sort of bits and pieces of like right. a life that you can sort of stick together in all kinds of ways. Yeah. And so we get the kinds of things that you were describing in Politogram, which is mm -hmm. the, the name of the, the, the thing, you, the book you were referring to earlier. We get people just picking and choosing some, from across this enormous space of, possible identities, right. sticking them together. And I want to say that that's a sort of form of immaturity in politics mm. because it's not a unified synthesis of like an idea. Right. But on the other hand, I also want to say that the kind of mm. response of much of the left has been to say, oh, no, no, just stick to the Leninist program. Just stick to the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the program of like revolutionary yeah, socialism. Yeah. And there's a difficulty there, right? Because on the one hand, I think some of the basic tenets of that are true and mm -hmm. accurate. And on the other I hand, do, I do as well. Yeah. lots of things are happening, right? right? New things are happening all the right. time. Um, there is AI, there is blockchain, there are right. new technological developments. Mm -hmm. SpaceX just like caught a rocket. Right. You know, extraordinary things are happening. Right. And I feel like there's a, a rigidity to much of the left response to that Mm -hmm. huge chaos of identities, huge chaos yeah. of politics. Yeah. And that rigidity prevents people from engaging with what is really new and exciting in the world. Yeah. Is that how you understand the sort yeah. of the tension there between a very disciplined, but ultimately quite restricted program right. and a completely indisciplined, but ultimately sort of very libidinally charged, but not coherent program? Is that yeah. the sort of tension you see? Well, let's, I, so this is, I mean, this is the stuff that we love to talk about and have spent like many years just uh, posting and chatting about this stuff. So um, I'm gonna try and break it down into a few different sections and then you uh, jump in as you so choose. But uh, to categorize or to, to qualify like what the left response is, it's kind of hard to determine like what even is the left or a left now. Um, is it, I mean, are we talking about political organizations that are largely ineffective? Are we talking about media organizations? It's, are we talking about elite academies where people write books about whatever made up words or some shit? Um, it's not <laughs> clear. It's not, it, we, we don't know, you know. Um, is, it, is it trade unions or like yeah. what, are we, what are we talking about? So um, yeah, the left response is uh, fractured because the left is fractured. The activity of young people on social media, I've given this example before, but the uh, people will be familiar with the political compass. This is an XY grid that plots, uh, plots left to right on the X axis and then authoritarian to libertarian on the Y axis. So you get double the resolution of this two party binary. This is a really like explosive idea for young people because now it's like, oh, there's all these different identities that I can choose from. It feels like an MMORPG, like it's, it's great. Um, it, I'm, you know, initially tempted to dismiss it as a kind of silly meme or whatever, but if you look into the history of this, what was originally called the world's smallest political quiz that was made by 
Um, his uh, David Nolan, I believe, is his name. He put it out in 1968 or 69. It's like six questions in, long or something. I think I think there was ten. This there's, there's oh, a few different yeah. versions of it. But uh, a few years later, he becomes one of the co-founders of the U.S. Libertarian Party. Like there is actually a deep political history to this thing. If you look back at, um, I believe it was called the Rampart Journal of Individualist Thought. This was published in 1969. Uh, I found this image on the archive of the Mises Institute, which is the Ludwig von Mises, like the libertarian thing tank like just as far far libertarian as you can get without becoming a monarchist uh, and um, they have in this you know 1968 issue an xy quadrant plotting essentially left right authoritarian libertarian like this is a kind of a sophisticated political analysis like i mean people who have ideology who have you know in many ways like shaped the 20th century that markets should be the force to allocate society's resources and whatever um you know, Ludwig von Mises is extremely influential. Uh, what does it mean when these hyperbolic, hyperpolitics, meme, shit poster kids who have no idea about political theory or history are using those same tools? And the great irony of this whole process is that sometimes they use them to derive ideas that are kind of fucking brilliant and really influential. Uh, so, th you know, things, things can surprise you. I would say that the in terms of this like response and Lenin and revolutionary socialism and I'm, I'm, I'm massively exaggerating the sense they're Leninist. But like, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's a there's a what what I mean, mean to point to that what I mean to point to there is the idea that for the left it often feels like there is nothing new under the sun. Right. That we have the analysis and now all is needed that's, to like that's put wrong, it into though. people. That's I, and I agree. That's yeah. Yeah. The, I mean I, I was just gonna say that the the terrain that we are fighting on right now, I think this is the most difficult thing because I am, you know, as anyone else, inspired by those texts and those ideas. But the terrain that we're fighting on now is neoliberalism, whose explicit project for like the past hundred years has been to create basically a patchwork of special economic zones to facilitate capital flight but restrict the movement of people to drain the social democratic countries of their resources and thus create a state or create an, a society that is entirely uh, governed, so to speak, by markets without democratic inputs. So that that is the like utopian vision from the neoliberals. Specifically, I'm referencing um, a book called Globalists by Quinn, Slo Quinn Slobodian and um, Crack Up Capitalism also goes into this by, by Quinn. If you want to um, learn about that book, you can listen to my interview with Quinn Slobodian on the RFM. It's a, he's, Fantastic, it's an extraordinary work, very, very important. Um, and, and I would say that like, unless that is the kind of framework of possibilities that you're looking at, it's kind of hard to put together a story of like what happened in the past 40 years or you know, the, like the latter half of the 20th century even. Like, unless your framework is like, the conflict right now is between neoliberalism and social democracy, social democracy is losing. And so when we start to talk about things like revolutionary socialism, it's just like, that is not, that's not the terrain that we are fighting on right now. That may be in the future, so it is important to keep those ideas alive. But if you're trying to bring that political program, like it's that that is not what's happening at this at this moment. You know, we are watching the um, basically the application of those neoliberal ideas be structured into code, which will be this new scaffolding of laws on top of the existing nation states as those things wither and become a you know anomalous feature of the 20th century or something like that. So I think it's it's important to look at those things, to know what you're gonna be fighting against, what the opportunities in those spaces are. Um, but yeah, yeah, I feel a little bit like um, it's great to take inspiration, but to, uh, I don't know, <laughs> approach revolutionary socialism right now, it's like, I, I don't, they're just gonna send the tanks and like, they'll take us out in an afternoon. You know, like, I, don't, I don't think that we're gonna stand much of a fighting chance. The other aspects of this, sort of ghost of a politics past, right? Revolution mm -hmm. socialism was a real movement in the 19th and 20th centuries. It did, obviously, you know, it, it succeeded in many places, right? Mm -hmm. it, to, in the sense that it took over lots of countries um, some, with massively varying results. Right. Um, the other aspect of this sort of understand, the sort of almost retrospective understanding of what mm -hmm. the stakes of politics are now is the idea of fascism. And that's kind of right. become a, the way in which certainly lots of Democrats yeah. understood what Trump is. Mm -hmm. One of the most upsetting moments of our of our coverage um, was in Dearborn in in, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. 
it's a very Arab Muslim, sorry, Arab American area of the, of the country. Uh, we were talking to lots of people who had extremely nuanced analyses. And we saw a, a, a pro-Palestinian demonstration mm -hmm. coming through the town. We went to go and film it. And this guy who we've been speaking to earlier, this guy, Joe, who told us he was voting Trump, it was very lovely and like sort of modest about like his, mm. his his knowledge of politics mm -hmm. and was just out walking his dogs and, we like, and he was like yeah you know you guys seem to really understand politics but i really think trump would be best he'd be best for peace he'd be best for sympathetic arguments right? right someone from the demonstration gets into this com this, this conversation with him mm. and he says you're supporting a literal nazi you're a literal fucking nazi and who is the Nazi in this case? Sorry, the, the person on the, on the demonstration shouts at Joe, who says, no, no, if you want peace in the Middle East, you need Trump. Oh, Trump is the Nazi in this. No, okay. no, and, but also by extension, this like very normal. We have a problem of calling everybody Nazi, right. basically. So, this is, so, so it's hard to keep track. <laughs> so it's not is, just my yeah. fault. It's like, it's everybody's fault. It's just, calling your opponent yeah. a Nazi seems to be like the de facto, yeah. And I, I think there were moments of the first Trump presidency, particularly in June 2020, for very specific reasons, mm -hmm. um, that I think are legitimately labelable as fascist, because you mm -hmm. get this coordination between an authoritarian state, deadly violence at a sort of local right, level, like right. militias and like people mm -hmm. coming out to kill people on the street. Yeah. And you also get a sort of a mass movement that stands against BLM. So I think these coordination, right. mm -hmm. this is what is useful to, to understand mm -hmm. fascism through. However, it was not uniformly fascist. It's not clear that it will be uniformly fascist again. What is at stake in this designation mm. Mm. of right. Trump as a fascist from the left and also from social democrats? Right. Oh, sorry, liberals, not social democrats. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you you hear it uh, all over. You hear it applied to to many people. Um, my my sense is that um, I like to describe it as uh, we're not talking about capital S socialism in the 21st century. And we're also not talking about capital F fascism. So uh, things are a little bit different now. Maybe they're socialistic, maybe they're fascistic. Uh, Mark Fisher has a great definition of this, that you know, fascism, we, we use it, um, we use the word to mean two things, which is race-based socialism or a kind of militaristic totalitarian state. And those things are uh, different in important ways. So uh, I'm also sympathetic to the idea that German fascism was different than Italian fascism is different than in whatever country and culture it comes from is going to be is going to be different. So the American version of fascism won't resemble those things, uh, and there are certainly things that are authoritarian and um, you know right wing populist and kind of ugly or or whatever. I also I there are actual Nazis is the thing like there are actually people in this space that are proposing the race-based socialism program. And so my concern is that at certain points, I mean, this is a really fringe movement. This is not like a big thing in the US. Um, but those people were kind of able to get their foot in the door because we were throwing around the term Nazi to be anyone we didn't like. And then people who have just fucking wild ideas about like metaphysical constructs of race that only exist in their fucking heads um, those guys got pretty big platforms, like really big platforms. Um, and so I have a little bit of a hesitation to kind of go around and, and just throw the F word to describe, you know, ev everybody and everything. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit conflicted about it. You know, I would be more, I think, I guess the way that I tend to do it is I, I describe things as being fascistic. Um, I very rarely call someone a Nazi unless they are li like literally a, a Nazi. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, and so I too feel scared about the Trump um, 2024 and onwards, like, you know, what he, he can get up to. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's complicated because a lot of those neoliberal ideas, which I still think we are fundamentally dealing with a trajectory of neoliberalism that has now found out it needs the nation state to kind of continue its program. It can't fully abolish the nation state, not yet. Um, but you know, Hayek, like the kind of original ideologue of a lot of these programs, like the road to serfdom was supposed to be an alternative to evade the, you know, totalitarian structures of fascism and Soviet communism. So there are really like important differences here. And when you're calling someone who is, a, you know, like free market libertarian, like also a, a Nazi, like the things, it just starts to get 
really, really fuzzy and it prevents us from disentangling the people who are like an economic populist like J.D. Vance or someone who is a like, you know, a, like a white supremacist, metaphysical, you know, destiny type of bullshit. Uh, and then people who are like, they're just, you know, I don't know, very much free market liberals. And the people who are in those audiences are on very different trajectories, some of which would be amenable to socialist politics if we could talk to them. But if we can't put them in the right category, we don't know what their motivations are. Like, it's a lot easier to make the kind of left social, social democratic trade unionist pitch to someone who is interested in like a J.D. Vance type of economic populism. They're receptive to that. But if they're into like they're just a white supremacist, going to be a lot more difficult. Or if they're into this free market libertarian stuff, um, they're not going to be interested in that either. So having these categories, like knowing who are the potential pools of people you can recruit from, really, really important. Um, I mean, it's a whatever. The attention economy is not going to give us enough time to discuss all of these different genres and categories and like political identities. Uh, and so, yeah, the kind of easiest thing to do, the most sensationalist version of this, is just to say that uh, Trump is a, a fascist and, and whatever. So, um, I'm just I'm, I'm a little bit worried. I like the Daniel Bessner position. People throw around fascism to mean anything that they don't like. Primarily, what this thing does is that it covers how bad liberal democracy actually is. I think that's the simplest way to describe it. My impression is that Trumpism has lost a lot of its cultural dynamism mm. in the last eight years. Mm. Certainly in 2016, it's felt like an insurgent movement. Yeah, well, it's yeah. very difficult to mm -hmm. seem like an insurgent when you've already been president. Right. Um, how would you describe the sort of the cultural politics of Trumpism now? How has it how has it shifted? Because it feels to me, right. people we spoke to, at least in Pennsylvania, didn't seem like they could be usefully slotted in the sort of the alt right bandwagon. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem. Some of them did seem sort of like they were sort of having a. A Christian, or Christo fascism, is it sometimes called? Like, yeah. particularly Christian nationalism. Christian sometimes. nationalism, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, this kind of thing that right. was definitely present. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of religiosity, which I want to come back to. Yeah. How would you describe the the sort of cultural dynamics of of, of Trumpism now? Yeah. Um, well, maybe just a, a quick comment on the religiosity thing. The uh, the kind of like the conservatism that we grew up with here in the states that was very like kind of free market oriented, Ronald Reagan type of stuff, like the the uh, lack of a desire for regulation on those markets was offset by the underpinning moral structures of Christianity that people yeah. care about each other, they care about their communities. And that's just so hard to maintain right now because the consequences of free market policies on everything are just like, oh, there's you can't be moral enough. It's like shit is just falling apart. So that's really under a lot of pressure. Um, and and it, that's why you see this drift towards like uh, protectionism, economic populism, whatever, abandon, abandonment of the free market ideas and uh, you know, maintaining the kind of Christian morality or, or whatever, um, because the market part has just like untethered from it. So um, yeah, I mean, these, there are again, a lot of different, a lot of different groups in it. And- um, But, but the, so the way the groups relate had a particular logic in 2016. Has that logic changed in 2024? Because it because it feels much more to me like a mass movement. That the the memes, so to speak, have diffused yeah. into the population right. in a general way. And it's actually much less like there are, you know, distinct camps who are self-describing themselves. And actually yeah. much more of a sort of a, a deep heterogeneity where one person simultaneously believes in the religious dimension of it, simultaneously believes in free markets yeah. and supporting Israel. Right. And that they're not right. a racist, and right. that like you know, right. and in the the women's places in the home, and yeah. also like a whole bunch of other things yeah. that you might think was relatively progressive. So there, there's a kind of a, there's just a, mm. a deep heterogeneity. I think yeah. that allows yeah. some of it. Uh, is that how it's me seeing? That's yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of a kind of group that gathered after the uh, the splintering of the alt right, what they called on the right the optics debate that. Um, it was better to present yourself as a white Christian than as a European pagan to an American audience. This was a kind of political decision among those groups. What came out of that was like a revitalization of the paleoconservative yeah. movement that was kind of directly in that lineage and was really influential for a while, but has now kind of, uh, it's, it's like fractured. It's not, um, it's not very healthy right now. Deplatforming is a big deal. It just um, it, it seems less, uh, less influential for a variety of reasons. I would say that the certainly the stigma has gone away. It's like very common for people to say like, yeah, well, uh, I don't like him, him being Trump, but you know, I think he's the better alternative. That has become a lot more uh, palatable. And then there's also a kind of a weird sense of like, 
I don't know, uh, transgression and taboo, and there's like very few things that are kind of off limit in uh, our society. And so, um, yeah, in that type of environment, the thing that feels a little bit contrarian and dangerous is to uh, <laughs> pretend to be like super conservative or something. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's hard to, you know, America is, uh, it's a big place and there's a lot of different cultures and a lot of different states. So it's kind of hard to like, I guess that's why we're so surprised by our polls and elections every single time it happens, because it would be easier if we were just talking about like Rhode Island, you know, a pretty contained geographic area, but there's just a lot of different groups and a lot of different areas and yeah, backgrounds and things like this. You have too many places. Um, yeah, we're 50 small countries. Yeah. Yeah. And one or two very big countries, right? California is on its own the like, right. seventh or eighth largest economy in the world. Yeah, you know, I saw I saw this tweet the other day that's just really fucking me up, which is that the uh, it was a map of um, this is by the uh, artist Daniel Keller. It was a map of all of the blue districts that are just like these tiny specks in like major metropolitan cities, and um, it describes them as being like proto network states, which is. <laughs> culturally uh like entirely coherent actually like their values like voluntary like self-associating utopian ideas from the early internet like that is true in all of those places and i think if given the option they probably would be i mean you hear this from people in in like blue states and like blue cities it's like well we're paying all the taxes and then it's going to these people in these like red zones and they have like what what are their cultural values like it's awful we should just leave them behind like mm. The liberals have been playing 5D chess with us this whole time. You know, they've been, they're the first ones. It's like, you thought it was coming from the reactionaries. It's actually coming from the Dem libs. They're the first yeah. network state. We've heard a lot about sort of, I mean, this is three or four years ago, the idea that Texas might sort of secede from the union, might, yeah, might yeah, leave yeah. the United States. But urban America could quite coherently sort of leave from the, the hinterlands, leave from the... Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see how long they last without any food. Um, <laughs> mass societies... We used to live in mass societies. Mm. Uh, we live in a society still, as uh, I believe was once said. I've seen some memes, yeah. But we don't live, I think, in, anymore in a mass society. Mm. Um, there was this period that we talked about a lot of, of atomization, a very mm. rapid atom uh, atom yeah. atomization from the 70s, for, for the late 60s through to, through to the 90s and to, early 2000s. My sense is that the internet has reversed some of that. People have stitched themselves back together in, 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 mm. in new kinds of ways. That has happened in a context in which there hasn't been much political organizing on the ground, but there have been lots more political ideas circulating and people have attached themselves to them. The product of this, the thing you get out of this, is what you might describe as hyperpolitics, right. which is a term that you right. already used, which is basically a sort of a way in which you could have, I mean, Kamala is a sort of airdropped candidate, right? You sort of like just simply <laughs> put her in. She's ran for like two elections in her whole life. Mm. One is Attorney General of California, where she almost lost mm. an inconceivable thing in California, right? California is like, they, she almost lost to a Republican in California. This is just you know, incredibly bad electoral <laughs> prospect. There's a real transformation of politics away from, on the, on, the, on the liberal side, away from addressing what is happening to you actually in your life mm. and towards a collection of talking points. One of the really astonishing things we found at the Kamala Harris rally we went to mm. is that people spoke in like fully formed paragraphs, but they weren't the fully formed paragraphs of real reflection on what their life is like now, apart from, I will say it again, apart from their things about abortion right access, which I think is obviously an extremely important issue. Mm. They were the kinds of paragraphs that you get when you're watching politicians on TV, right? They gave us politician answers. Yeah, yeah. The Trump people did not do that. Mm -hmm. or they no, gave, they didn't. They, they, yeah. they, gave, they gave like politician answers, but the politician they gave the answers of was Donald Trump, who has this sort of, this weave style <laughs> yeah, of speaking yeah. where it sort <laughs> right. of goes about all over the place. Yeah, and sort yeah. of, you know. It's um, not like uh, PR crafted by a team of experts no. who are, yeah. And so there is that sort of strange mass adoption of the style of speaking of, of politics, mm -hmm. sort of politicians rather, on TV. How do you understand where liberal culture is at mm. now? Mm. Uh, I mean, well, the, the language is um, uh, clearly uh, falling apart in, in many cases. I, I think they're in a moment of like a, a huge moment of reckoning, uh, essentially, right? Like they, the, uh, it was possible to maintain different types of like fictional narratives for 2016 and 2020 and to like just ignore, you know, the, the kind of like overwhelming clear arc of what was going on, which I would say is a, a 
class dealignment from the institutions for labor, the working class are still very much enmeshed with the Democratic Party, but the workers are voting for these this other kind of like, they would rather live under the brutal dictatorship of like merchant right, small business politics than under whatever weird ideology has gripped the, the Democrats. Um, and so, yeah, that, that dealignment is, I would say that is the, the story. Um, the liberals now in 2024, you can't even say it's like, well, we won the popular vote. You can't even say it's like, well, we won with, a, you know, he's a white supremacist and, you know, look at how all of the, the people of color voted. It's like, all of the, like, the Democrats are making gains with like, the white Latin, men maybe, Latino but they're men. losing every, yeah. everyone else. Like just proportionally, like those, every demographic keeps shifting towards Republicans. So it's just, it's very hard to put together a narrative of like what happened where they do not need to confront reality. And they have not confronted reality for eight fucking years, which drives <laughs> drive me crazy. I feel like a broken record. Uh, but I also understand it's like, that's, that is kind of the, the necessity of doing this stuff is to just say it, timestamp it and be patient and then wait until they have to, the narrative breaks, you have to go back to reality at some point. That could happen now. I was trying to, we both participate in uh, Discord communities a lot and have exchanges with people kind of like speculate on what the political future is going to turn into. The most like black-pilled interpretation that I think may be possible, so we'll, we'll timestamp this and I hope I'm wrong about it, but the liberal response after not being able to construct together a narrative, you'll get the you know the racism, sexism, and, and this kind of stuff. But that's just it's not strong enough because there's quantitative data that just firmly you know it, they're not making those those gains. They're losing with those demos. Um, I think it's going to be something like biggest divide uh, that's emerging now. The Gulf is college educated, not college educated. It's going to be that ordinary people are too stupid to participate in elections. And to save democracy, we need to have only educated people vote. That is, I think that that is like, you're seeing inklings of this already from the liberals, you know, that you actually have to like remove the franchise from people to preserve democracy. <laughs> Whatever the fuck that means. As, as much as we throw around the word fascism to mean anything, the liberals are throwing around democracy to mean goddamn anything nowadays. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that, that that's going to, you're going to see like a strain of this thing emerge, whether that's scalable. I think this is like basically a rebuild from the ground up. There's no, there's no coherent way to explain this story other than devastating loss on like every front, every category, every angle that you look at it. It's like just a bloodbath, you know. I think that that turn inside liberalism towards an authoritarianism is is really key, and I think that's yeah, that's like yeah. an incredibly important way of thinking about the the present, and also the opposite direction, right? Is that in Trump, the Republicans finally found someone who is an authoritarian, who right. does believe right. in like social discipline, mm -hmm. and does believe in brutalizing people, but who appears as an anti-authoritarian, mm. who appears to give expression to the mm -hmm. kinds of things that the Democrats wouldn't allow you to say, who appears to give expression to that. And that's the real sort of crux, the political problem, mm -hmm. I think, of the current moment, which is that the people who are real authoritarians right. appear as anti-authoritarian. Yeah. And the people who have an ambivalent relationship to authoritarianism, liberals, are increasingly becoming authoritarian right. in, 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 in many different sort of areas of life, yeah. moving from sort of yeah. cultural politics, yeah. now towards moving things like, you know, actually advocating for removing the franchise, which is right. about as intensely authoritarian as you, as you get in a side liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can throw yeah. something in for that, there's um, um, the, the guys from the um, Alpha Bunga Bunga cast, they have this great book called The End of the End of History. Uh, and there's, yeah, there is this kind of like slow erosion of what liberals would have uh, stood up for maybe like a, a generation ago or a few decades ago of like, you know, freedom of speech and uh, privacy and just all of this stuff that like were, were supposed to be like the liberties side of liberalism, like the rights that are given to individuals. Those things have eroded with like the Patriot Act with, you know, forms of surveillance, all, all of this types of stuff. Uh, and now there's a major push from the same liberals who claim to uphold these values to like censor free speech and put down debate and all of this kind of stuff. And, um, just if you look at this slow erosion, like it starts to make sense that that those values are not going to be, that's not what they're moving towards, you know, like they, they've kind of celebrated these things. It has become part of the, 
uh, the, the party platform, like liberal authoritarianism, my friend Catherine Liu, who's also a frequent guest on the, the Bunga cast. Um, yeah, I think liberal authoritarianism is a great word for it. I think there's a huge opportunity now for, uh, for the left and for young people to, like, to harness that, an that real anti-authoritarian impulse. You know, it's like when I was when I was young, that was the thing that all of our kind of cultural identities, like musical genres or whatever, are like kind of pseudo political identities. Like that, that's a good impulse, actually. That is like an impulse that is like necessary for any kind of like left politics. Uh, yeah, so I see that kind of as an opportunity, you know. And and the kind of great irony is that on the I'm really interested in the cultural side of these things where ideas are kind of implicit, they're soft, and then they later become a political commitment. Like that's the, the point, the purpose of the research I've been doing. Um, and so right now it seems like there's an opportunity to kind of harness the anti-authoritarian impulse that is uh, leading young people, particularly young men, to kind of like fall into this Trump camp versus the liberal authoritarianism because it is on its face authoritarian. Where Trump at least has this kind of plausible deniability that he's uh, kind of... Uh, anti-authoritarian garb and then you know you you turn it around and it's like oh it's been authoritarianism this whole time yeah, yeah. i definitely remember drawing an anarchist a symbol on a skate park uh in the very like yeah. sleepy southern english town in which i grew up like, right, right. Kind of, I was like yeah like anarchy right um, yeah yeah that, that was yeah perhaps an embarrassing moment in my you were probably what like 14 or something, oh, something like, that. like that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's important that's what 14 year olds are supposed yeah. to do the the puzzle. So I, I, I want to come back to this religiosity thing. Mm. The the puzzle for um, critical theory, right? Mm. To talk in that sort of terms. The puzzle for critical theory was always why is it that um, Germany, which is at this point in the nineteen thirties the most advanced country in the world mm. uh, economically, why is it that it's reverted to what looks like ancient barbarism? Why is mm. it that it's gone backwards? Right. And one of the answers that um, is given by, by Adorno is that there is, because people no longer truly believe in authority, they have to perform authority. They have to perform their intensity. And he mm, talks about this in right, the context right. of anti-Semitism. Yeah, so people don't, yeah. people don't really believe that the Jews are demons, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they are made to believe it. And therefore they have to perform intensity so it seems like they really believe it. Right. There's a sort of this reversal. We've been speaking to loads of people mm. who in this incredibly advanced country, America, have deep, deep religious beliefs where they honestly seem to believe that it was Jesus who elected Trump and not the American electorate. Yeah, right. Right? Right. How do we understand this sort of, this to and fro of like history, this kind of sense that history is sort of looping back on itself to yeah. resuscitate this kind of ancient <sighs> right. irrationality? Right. Because that yeah, seems yeah. to be genuinely all there. Yeah. And I think it's also a motor, this sort of mm -hmm. metaphysical thing you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. There is a kind of motor in some parts of the right that is that, that mm -hmm. ancient irrationality. Mm -hmm. How do you understand where we're at with that? That's a, no, that's a great, that's a great analogy. Um, I, th I think I want to approach this from the, uh, the march through institutions, the history of the left in the United States. So... Um, yeah, whatever the political program is, uh, feels kind of like fake, invalid, delegitimized now, and it's kind of being played out in these like very weird performative ways uh, that are entirely incoherent. I feel like the incoherence of politics now, that's not, that's not like the, the person who believes that Jesus elected Trump, it's not their fault that they believe that. It's that where the messaging is supposed to be coming from, the coherent political analysis, that is not very strong. So there's no quality signal to noise ratio that can reach that person. And as a result, their politics are just the noise. And they believe 10 different things in 10 different directions. It's, you know, they, they like to say that you know, Americans are, they're all centrist. They're centrist because they have political beliefs on like every different fucking side of the spectrum. And then they average them together and they're in the middle. But that doesn't mean that they're a centrist on any fucking issue. They're like right on this, left on this, and just in, insane stuff. So um, yeah, I would say that the, the messaging that has come from um, the left, because that's, I, I would be able to tell you left, uh, less about the right. But uh, as the left, you know, marched through these institutions and enshrined those values and whatever, like you just see, you know, a slow drift from the kind of new left boomer generation over the following decades to like 
that's a pretty you know upper middle class prestigious life those people have class interests there are weird incentives in their institutions where to get upward mobility and jobs and whatever like you have to kind of like invent new forms of oppression and increasingly specification and it's just there's like a lot of the basically the dysfunction of the institutions where quality messaging signal should be coming from is being drowned out by the noise because the the signal is not good. It's not. It's not a good narrative, um, and so yeah. If you want that, like, this is kind of the big like meta problem: is that you have to rebuild legitimate institutions that can make coherent, rigorous narratives that can persuade normal people when they hear them. Like that's that's actually the problem. But in that know? sense, aren't you agreeing with the liberals, right? So aren't, aren't you agreeing that there is a sort of a, a necessity of a sort of top down mm. from the institutions to the people, mm-hmm. sort of cultural politics is necessary? Aren't you just advocating a slightly I mean, different I'm, version of like? Yeah, you could also you'd also describe it as a vanguard too. You know, I, it doesn't necessarily like the institutions. They may not be because I talked about university professors before. They might come from universities. They might also come from like a coherent trade union movement. They might come from a political organization. When I say institution, it is a space in which uh, decisions are deliberated around a table and not determined by markets and prices and, and stuff like that. So, uh, kind of many different institutions, and I think they're going to be new ones. <laughs> I think the liberal uh, instinct right now is to, like preserve institutions that are entirely captured by elite interests and have been captured by elite interests for basically as long as I've been alive. That like there's no one left in this who is legit or honest or not just acting in their own selfish interests, right? So like to participate in these structures, they pay so little. Like academia, for example, is like the only way to do that is to have access to intergenerational wealth. Like they are literally recruiting from the pool of the capitalist class. So it's it's kind of it's bankrupt on its face. The institutional structure itself is absolutely necessary, but um, I'm really now of the opinion that. Uh, it is, it is not, they're not savable. They're not savable. I think probably institutions may be, really zooming out here, they may be cyclical in that like after a certain period, an institutional structure will just be entirely conquered by bureaucracy, politics, perverse incentives or, or whatever. Um, and that it might just like kind of, it might age out, you know? Like there are periods in which what legitimizes an institution is that uh, they, say, they say no. They say no at certain parts. Right, it's like, well, we would like to do this at, at the magazine, for example. We'd really like to publish this piece because we know it'll get a ton of traffic and it'll be great. And there's someone at the editorial board that says, like, no, that's not what this magazine stands for. And that stuff has kind of just gone out of the room. Where now, like, you just see this kind of erosion, encroachment of markets onto every institutional structure. And uh, yeah, I mean, just, um, just. Get rid of them. You're not going to save CNN. We don't need better people at CNN. We don't need CNN. That's that's the only you know. I would say like you're doing a better job than CNN. <laughs> I would rather see see you thrive, grow, become a new institution in the 21st century, uh, and then you know, after that, like there 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 may be other things that occur in the future. You know, talking like 50 year arcs or or whatever. But yeah, I'm not. I don't like this liberal idea that the New York Times is going to be the thing that corrects society. We met on our on our travels some real nihilists, some mm. people who did have exactly what you're describing here, very extreme beliefs on this side, very extreme beliefs on that side, across the spectrum. I think they were on coke, so that might have contributed a bit <laughs> to them, but I think they were. They were also probably have those opinions most of the rest of the time as well. <laughs> that nihilism, that sense that nothing really matters or can really grip you or can really convince you of anything because it's all markets, it's all just a sham, it's all just for show, it's all just uh, you know, uh, marketized incentive, incentives like you were describing in institutions. Mm-hmm. That sense is very pervasive. Mm-hmm. And I see this religiosity as a way of getting away from that. So you know, I'm going to double down on this absolutely certain thing. I, oh, like, sure. so, yeah, like, yeah. I know that things are fake. Mm-hmm. But there's one thing that is true, and I'm just going to double down on that. And that's how you get that intensity yeah. of religious feeling right. in the midst of this nihilism. I think the, that mm-hmm. feeling of pervasive nihilism and the feeling of religiosity produce each other in, right. in, in, in a sort right. of a, yeah. um, uh, you know, there's a sort of tense relationship there. The Democrats don't seem to be very good at harnessing nihilism. Mm. Is there a coherent left nihilism? Mm. Can you say, yeah, sure, nothing matters? Right. Or, or like, is right. that even a kind of nonsense project? I, I don't know. Like, how, how does, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe the question is, nor like, is there a coherent p- 
political, you know, a thing you'd write down. But what does the left do with those, that nihilistic drive right, that right. persists through society? Does it have just have to defeat it? Or is there yeah. a harnessing it, moving it for other ends? Yeah, I mean, so I, look, I, I totally, um, totally agree. Yeah, there's this kind of like pronounced theocratic element that, yeah, Jesus elected Trump and this kind of thing. I think there is some section of society that just is theocratic and who knows where it comes from. And let's say it's, you know, 10 or 20% of society that just believes that they're going to think that way. There's no way to, uh, to convince them or persuade them or whatever. They're just going to think that forever for the rest of their lives. But that thing is disproportionately grown. And so this is people who, these are people who are adopting this belief system because nothing else kind of makes sense, right? You're in this totally nihilistic environment. Here's something to believe in. You don't have to rationally justify it or whatever. You know, the purpose is its irrationality. Um, so that, that bubble is being blown by the lack of a coherent vision, any, you know, idea for a, you know, progressive, better future, whatever. I am, I am very much of the mind of the, you know, Mark Fisher, capitalist realism, the problem is to propose an alternative. I was very much inspired by books like Inventing the Future from Nick Zernick and Alex William. I've had Nick on the, the podcast. These kind of left accelerationist ideas that you know, largely came from the UK uh, and tried to propose something um, that was a more positive vision to, to capture the political imaginary. And if you don't have a North Star that you're moving towards, you're just not going to make any progress. You're not going to move at all. Um, I have I, I have ideas. I have inklings of like what this thing might be, you know, of like what the um, the opportunities are. They're they're a little weird, you know. It's not. It doesn't look like things that I think we're we're used to to talking about. Um, I would say it's to counter the nihilism. You need to have a kind of positive vision, you know. I'm I'm very I'm interested in ideas like platform socialism. I'm interested in the kind of uh, incredibly surprising actually existing realities of planned economies accomplished through giant transnational capitalist corporations larger than nation states like it it just fundamentally upends the whole 20th conversa- 20th century conversation the cold war dichotomy of capitalism and socialism it proves that you know in the 20th century we thought that hayek had won the economic calculation debate mises and hayek are victorious the soviets can't calculate you know prices and, and whatever so the free market system wins through that total domination of the free market system lo and behold it turns out planning worked the whole fucking time and it's just this kind of completely backward situation but if planning does work you can introduce democracy into the planning you don't need the you don't need the markets to allocate everything. Like I, that is just such a profoundly inspiring, incredible idea with so much potential. Um, but it's I don't know, basically nowhere on the landscape. It's an idea of like uh, you know a dozen different thinkers who are interested in these kind of things. I think it will become a very influential political force in the you know within our lifetimes. Um, whether that's scalable now, I, d- I don't I don't know. But um, yeah, I. I can't answer the nihilism question without proposing some kind of positive vision. That, is, that to me is kind of like this, this opportunity, you know, like whatever the, the project of class struggle is, like what is the thing that we are trying to instantiate? What is that positive vision? It would be introducing democracy to the economic planning, um, nationalized Amazon, Google, Walmart, like those types of things. I, I feel like that's a, that's a pretty compelling case for the 21st century. One of the most upsetting, well, I've said that several times now. There are lots of upsetting interviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the people who we spoke to who was a, a Republican, she was volunteering um, out in Beaver County in, in rural Pennsylvania, mm. north, of, north of Pittsburgh. Right. She said that she really liked all the, what she described as infrastructure money that was coming into town. That's Biden's right. uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Right. She loved that. Yeah, she had yeah. no sense that it was from the from the Democrats. And then I was like, "Isn't that really Biden's policy?" And she was like, "All Biden's policy is is spend, spend, spend." And I was like, uh, "Oh, but, but, but spend in your town uh, on the thing you wanted to be." So there's obviously uh, beautiful. There's obviously a failure of yeah, political yeah. communication there, very right. clearly. But I also right. want to, yeah. no, no, this is big. Yeah, yeah. But I also want to. I mean, so I'm not. I'm not going to go mm. down. Unfortunately, I, mm. I, I also want to push back on the the idea that you can sort of propose a positive vision in face of nihilism, mm. because I think nihilism also speaks to things that the left is very uncomfortable with. Mm. Things mm. like people 
like real intensity. Like they, yeah. so they they like housing. They like you know um, the idea that you could more you know justifiably equitably uh, yeah. distribute resources. Right. They like the idea of getting a doctor's appointment, but they don't really love it. Right in the same right. kind of visceral way that people seem to love Trump. Yeah. They love what he allows them to express. They love the violence he allows them to express, and yes. so on. Yes. Can the left harness that kind of deep-seated? Mm -hmm. I don't don't use any sort of psychoanalysis here, but like, can there's like a bloodlust yeah. that I've seen in yeah. people. Mm -hmm. Can the left harness that, or is it just like something evil in society, that, or not evil, but like bad inside it that we have to just dispense with? Right. Right. Well. Okay. So I I guess the thing that I want to try to get under here is that the ideas in people's heads. Uh, do not necessarily correlate as a direct one-to-one -one of their political activity. So uh, let's say, okay, 10% of society, are, they're just theocrats. Who knows how big the percentage is? They're just theocrats. There's nothing we can do about it. We can never convince them otherwise. Let's say 10% of society are just nihilists. We are never going to be able to persuade them or make them think differently. If those people are working in an Amazon fulfillment center and there is a rigorously organized rank and file union that the message comes from the top down that's like, we, our union is going to be broken, your wages are going to be cut in half if you know, this person gets elected. My wager is that like, it's not going to be what they, it's not going to be the thoughts in their head. They are going to vote with their, their organization in, in solidarity. Like there's all sorts of kind of incoherent belief systems people have, but then the effect is that they, they will just, they'll follow the kind of rank and file instruction. Um, I, I think that those things are kind of a pretty effective, um, they're a pretty effective bulwark against this kind of, I, what I would describe as like a kind of liberal impulse to try and just rationally persuade everybody to think the same way. Um, like you're never gonna persuade a theocrat that God does not exist, right? But like if, the, <laughs> if they vote in solidarity with their union, um, they might not be a materialist even, but th their political activity is not going to correlate to the stuff in their head. Because then we're, we're kind of on this endless runaway problem of needing to correct the thoughts that people have in their head. Um, we can find other lever levers that kind of gate their political activity. Uh, that's like membership to different types of organizations, union, politics, like whatever it is. Uh, you, you know, like social affinities, things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, all sorts of people... Uh, that vote one way and think another. Um, trying to persuade every individual is sometimes a losing game too. And for people who are in the business of talking about stuff, it's yeah <laughs> important for us to remember sometimes. I persuade everyone who I speak to. Uh, so you is, are that... very persuasive, actually. I did see you uh, talk to some of these people, and they were like, "Oh, that no, yeah, that makes sense." I think that people, I, you just ask them the question. Mm -hmm. You're like, "How are you doing? Why are you here?" And they'll tell you something, and then you just like double click on one of the friendly phrases they said yeah, and you just yeah. repeat it back to them right. and they just say something else and say something else and I think one thing that really gets this sort of unraveling aspect that we've definitely had in lots of our interviews has been that people have never actually encountered the fourth thought so they, they, they know why they're there they have a right. rationale yeah, yeah. and they have the, they like know why that's connected to and then it's connected to that but no one has stood around to like listen to them for like four or five thoughts in a sequence and yeah. so the fourth thought is actually yeah. really alien to them they're like, oh, I think that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that. And that's, that's why I'm here. And right. it's, it, watching that process of discovery mm -hmm. of people realizing they have <laughs> reasons for doing things that are actually strange even to them has been really, yeah. really interesting. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's wild, but this is... Um, so I did an interview with uh, Caleb Kane recently. Uh, he was known as Faraday Speaks online. He published this video to YouTube, How I Fell Down the Alt-Right Pipeline, I believe it was titled. He was then profiled in the New York Times, um, the making of a YouTube radical uh, that same year, then featured in the Rabbit Hole podcast from the Times the, the year after. Um, really kind of like the case study for, for a lot of these things, how someone gets you know, uh, a pipeline to rabbit hole into a political belief system. And he told me in that interview basically exactly the same thing that you just did uh, about like exchanges in a Discord server where, as he described it, was like, just keep asking people questions create the opportunity for cognitive dissonance, and then they have to kind of close that gap. Uh, and in some cases, like, they close that gap and they realize, like, it, this can work badly too. They realize, oh, I'm even more racist than I thought. Like, it cannot, it's not, it's not great <laughs> at some points. But in most cases, people realize that they're basically being 
their, their brain is um, being ridden by a bunch of bad memes that they're repeating from talking points on TV or literal memes with top text like reaction image below uh, or, or just kind of mimetic transmittable ideas. And if you ask someone to explain from the ground up what is their political program and vision for the world line by line, a lot of us are unable to do that. And so, yeah, I mean, that is, uh, it's actually just very, very effective to allow people to kind of unravel through that process and realize that, oh, I, I don't know what I'm talking about right now. Actually, I don't have an answer for this. And yeah, just double clicking, like, okay, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I guess the, the, the necessary part of this is to like, when you see those things, you have to like, well, you know, there is kind of like a left-wing answer to this. You know, that's the, that would be kind of an important part of it, too. I, I, I wish I could say that we edited that out, but I just don't do that. I just, I just, don't, I just don't tell anyone that there are alternative explanations. I, I, perhaps I, well, it does seem some of the people you're talking to, they're, they're probably not going to. I think that, that one woman who said that like 80% of Palestinians are Hamas, they're yeah. just like, holy shit, this is okay. Most probably them, probably most not worth uh, engaging. In most of them live in the West Bank. Yeah. Um, it does not even, not even geographically coherent, but I don't think she would even be able to point out her sign on the map. Um, the next four years is going to be um, a lot of self care. People are going to be doing a lot of self care. The fucking, the amount of like privi- privileged liberal elites that are doing self care right now. Like, what about like? I don't think that anyone who works in an Amazon fulfillment center who is like at risk for their family being deported is doing fucking self-care right now. Like the, these people, they are the most privileged people that exist in our society. Let, let's not get, don't, don't give them any more self-care. They're taking a week. I know people are taking a week off of work. Like you have to show up for your fucking shift or you get fired. Imagine having a job where you can take a week off of work and you need self-care. You're already, you're already there. You're already cared for. You're already comfortable. Give me a fucking break. Is, Get back to work. That's it. I'm, I'm renouncing all of my. No, I'm just, none. We need we, the people. The people who are immiserated by miserable working conditions right now. They need to be able to take a week off. And all these people who are taking a break to do self care now. Give me a fucking break. We need to get them. You know, crack crack back to work. Nine a.m. tomorrow morning. That's it. It's a Sunday tomorrow as well. So that's uh, that's really uh, really pushing it. Um, the... <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. now we see your true face. Sorry, you, I interrupted you, your you, whole you, question. You, 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 but you like... flip around the, the, <laughs> the, the um, mogging looks Max, Josh Cedarella face, and you get the, uh, you know, the, the, the whip hand of the, uh, the supply chain. Um, there's going to be a lot of self care and mm-hmm. lots of tutting, lots of watching the news, lots of watching mm-hmm. MSNBC, lots of watching Rachel Maddow, yeah. who I believe has started to. Right. Question the election validity and so on already. This really? Is, this is like a part of the, oh, yeah. God, you love to see it. <laughs> Which is amazing. I, like, I think it's, yeah. it's really extraordinary. Yeah. Um, what is the left practice in this moment? Like, what mm. is that? What is the next four years? Not like right now, you yeah. have to do this thing, like right. tomorrow. But like, right. there's, a, there's a four year struggle here. What is that left practice like for the next four years? How can it be sustainable? Can it be sustainable? Where are the key areas where it needs to be? organizing it's yeah. possibly mass deportations right like really massive deportations right that's going to be a, a, a human disaster right what is left practice now well you've i mean you've heard it from from bernie sanders to david brooks that the the problem is the dealignment of the working class from what was supposed to be the party of labor versus the party of capital right the democrats were supposed to represent labor Republicans' capital, that was a conflict. That is not the, the, that's not the terrain we're playing on anymore. So the goal is to even get back to that if we hope to have some impoverished 21st century version of social democracy, that even that is a, a struggle. So I think there's a whole ton of steps to get to that. Um, one is like, what, what is the terrain you're playing on is kind of the most important one. Um, a kind of a socialist organization in the United States that is uh, coherent and not entirely captured by the interests of squibbling middle-class graphic designers would probably be an important feature. Uh, the, <laughs> I mean, people, people who you know, do jobs like what, what I do, and you know, I'm, I'm very much of this right. world. Yeah. So, I, yeah, yeah, no, we both come from the yeah. yeah. Uh, and and it's important to be able to recognize that because it's actually it's, I've, I've been in some of these meetings and it's really difficult to get kind of just a regular idea that appeals to working people into discussion in many cases. Um, so yeah, a rebuilding of like the socialist organizations in the U.S. 
The, uh, the good news, it, there's not much of it, but like if we are actually bring, bringing jobs back, if we are reindustrializing and so on, you can organize your shop floor. Uh, it's hard to organize your Slack channel. So if the type of work that people are doing is actually you know, better for the trade union portion of this, um, that, you know, that might be working to our advantage through no success of our own, by the way. Just <laughs> that's how the cards fall. Um, there's also, I mean, you know, I think my particular role in this, and maybe yours as well, is that like part of the, uh, the cultural layer of all of this is that people who had really right-wing ideas were just kind of early to the internet, and you know, as long as I've been following these spaces, like the left is just proportionally smaller. I don't think that has to be the case. I think we're watching basically the early adopter benefits of these things play out. Um, so building up large media organizations that publish with a not kind of like, you know, soft liberal message, but just like, it's fucking class war. It's been fucking class war for 40 years and that's why your life is fucking terrible. Like say that and like don't flinch from it. Like after, after this unanimous like bloodbath of a defeat, there is no reason to maintain like the pretense, the etiquette of the court, like all these people need to be thrown out, pushed out in the iceberg, and it's just fucking class war. That's the, that's the only thing to do. So the, the media message has to lead with that. Over time, like this has been the purpose of the research, you watch someone get educated over the course of eight years, like it does, it can affect their decisions. Like when, when that person who is introduced to the messaging at age 15 sees a silly meme about the left or whatever, and they think it's bullshit and they're like doing their Gamergate, whatever culture they're a part of, when they are 25 years old and in the fulfillment center and they're asked to join a union, like they will be very happy that they got a bit of that messaging 10 years ago. Like the, the seeds that you're planting are gonna bear fruit like far, far later. So it's, you know, a whole portfolio of these different things at every different level, rebuilding the institutions, rebuilding the labor unions, rebuilding the, uh, the party affiliations, even the socialist organizations that are kind of adjacent to the political parties, and then essentially building quality media that does the role of political education and what radical newspapers used to do in an older media era. You know, it's, it's all of that. It's all of that. And I guess if you're, if you're at home and you're watching this and you're thinking about, well, where, where do I fit into those things? F find which one of those is the important thing for you to do and it's going to be different for everybody. But uh, yeah, I don't think there's like one specific thing that, you know, if we do this, then we've, we've figured it out. You know, it's like this is a total, a total rebuild, basically. Josh Cedrella, thank you for coming on the bar. Thank you.